<laughs> if I had a pound for every time somebody asked me to make a ZX Spectrum Furby interface, I'd have zero pounds. But I'm not going to let that put me off. I got my hands on this little thing a couple of weeks ago, and being a fan of Look Mum No Computer's Furby organ, take a look at the link in the description, you got to see that if you haven't seen it already, I decided the only right thing to do with this is skin it, hack it, and hook it up to a Spectrum. I've never designed an interface before, so what we're going to do in this video is design an interface to control some binary outputs which will ultimately hook into the Furby. So what have I got planned for Mr. Furby? Well, we're going to interface with our ZX Spectrum via the edge connector and an interface which we'll design. The interface will have some circuitry on it and a case around it, hopefully in the end, where Mr. Furby can sit and interact with you via your games or whatever it is you want to do if you want to just control the Furby with the computer or if you want to make a daft game where you try to wake the Furby up or not wake the Furby up, sneak around it. The possibilities are endless really when it comes to Furby hacking, obviously. So how is this going to work? There will be a Z80 PIO chip and this chip will receive the data bus from the ZX Spectrum. It will receive some control signals from the ZX Spectrum as well as 5 volts and ground. The Z80 PIO has two ports a and B. Each one of these is one byte or eight bits and we can control every one of those eight bits so we've got basically 16 boolean outputs to play with and hopefully we can get away with just using one part and this will send commands to Mr. Furby. I've got some examples in this book of how to hook this chip up. There's our little diagram. Here's our globe. Feel free to pause and read. It's a great book. This explains how to interface with it. And here's a little demonstration of how you can read inputs from these switches and send outputs via these LEDs using the chip. Not so interested in inputs, so we're just going to hook everything up as an output, like these LEDs and those will hook up to various inputs on this board which is within our Furby. In fact it's this connector or these two connectors which we're gonna splice off little wires make a little loom which will connect to a header on our breadboard or on our little circuit board interface and we'll be able to control things such as wake and sleep and tilt and whatever else we want the thing to do. We could even output loading sounds through the speaker on the Furby if we were so inclined. We're going to start by leaving the Furby out of the picture and we'll have eight LEDs. What does that look like? Something like that, right? If we can control those LEDs, we'll be laughing. So I picked up some lovely Matrix style breadboards, which I've never used before, so it's going to be fun to learn how to get to grips with these and this right angled spectrum edge connector which should make hooking it up to the specy pretty easy. It's just going to slot in like this. In the end the Furby will sit on top of a case which will 3D print and paint up but we're still prototyping so let's put the Furby to one side and get familiar with our PIO chip. I've had this on the shelf for years so I'm excited to put it to some use. I actually got this with the second spectrum ever repaired on the channel so yeah a bit of a blast from the past. We're going to slot it in here, I'm not quite sure where would be the most efficient place to slot it in terms of the pin locations on the edge connector and the chip itself, and Furby's going to sit on top. The right angled edge connector wasn't the best choice to be honest, um, the board sits kind of underneath the spectrum case, 
So this is just going to serve us as a prototype board and when we print the PCB we'll use a parallel edge connector and attach it to the top and bottom side of the board. If we take the dander nature as an example you can see the pins come out from the connector parallel, one row on top of the board, one row on the bottom, it definitely seems to be the best way to go. Anyway let's get this connector soldered on and aligned. Alright, we're away. Let's have a quick check that it fits okay. Yeah, that's pretty much as good as it's gonna get. After studying the pinouts, I've decided to put the PIO chip in this way around in this location. So let's solder that in place. Now we can start hooking it up. I'm going to start with 5 volts and ground. There's our 5 volts. I'm not going to lie, that was really fiddly, the first one I've done with this kind of board, but I got into the flow of it as we'll see, and uh, got the knack of it. There's our ground. I've only got 5 colours of wire to play with, so I'm going to try and be sensible with them. We'll have red for 5 volts, white for ground, blue for the data bus which is going in next. There's our whole data bus connected up. Next up we can start with some control lines, which is basically the address lines and some I.O. stuff from the Z80. Those are going to be yellow for the I.O. stuff and green for the three address lines. Next I'm going to line up eight LEDs to show the state of the outputs, one or zero. And because the Z80 PIO can't deliver the current to uh, light the LEDs up, we're going to use this 74LS14 inverter chip in between the PIO chip and the LEDs just so they get enough current. We need to consider that this is an inverter chip when we control the outputs from the PIO, but this is going to do us. Actually, this chip can only drive six outputs, so I'm only going to use six of these. Each LED is going to need a resistor before it so we don't burn them out. There's those fitted now. Our intermediate 74LS chip is going to need power and ground, so let's get those plumbed in. The last thing to do is hook 5 volts up to all of the LEDs by bridging along this row, which will allow us to turn them on and off by switching the other side of it to 5 volts or 0 volts. Here's the finished article. It'll hopefully be a bit more neat on the proper PCB. I guess I'll use PCB way or somewhere like that. Maybe if I keep saying PCB way they'll get in touch and sponsor me, but who knows. Let's plug it into the Harlequin and see what happens. I noticed the LEDs came on straight away, but that got me thinking. The PIO uh, port outputs, the 8 data bits on port A and the 8 on port B, they initialize to high impedance, which is basically giving the inputs to the 74LS chip the equivalent of open circuit, so maybe a pull-up or pull-down resistor might be a good idea. Crucially, the machine booted without any problems, so I haven't buggered anything up with my soldering, not too seriously anyway. Here's our test program, which defines our data port as port 31, and our control port as port 93. The first thing we do is send values of 1 onto D7 and D6. We achieve that with line 40, which outputs 255, all 1s, to the CA port. We then output 0 onto the CA port, and what this tells us is that all 8 of the binary outputs of that port should be treated as outputs. If we wanted any of them to be an input, we'd set them to 1. We then ask the user which number they want to output, and that is sent on the data port, DA, under the variable name, A. What should happen then is the LEDs will light up in binary, showing the number that the user entered. Let's give it a try. I'm going to type in 3, and that looks like 3 in binary to me. 5, yeah, that works. 32, seems to be working great. So there's our concept proven out. All we need to do next is a few more modifications and hook up those outputs to our Furby and then we'll have our Furby interface prototype up and running. I hope you all enjoyed this, stay tuned for part 2.